Okay, we're here to learn about flux. Flux comes from the word flow. And so when we talk about electric flux, it's a bit of a misnomer because electric flux isn't really a flow. If you draw a picture of an electric charge, it looks like the field is flowing out from the charge, but in the case of the electric charge, it's not. If it were a light bulb, then these lines would represent the flow of light out from the bulb, and it would be truly a flow. Or if this were a sprinkler, and it were spraying water, it would be a flux of water out of the sprinkler. And if this were a radioactive substance, and it were emitting radiation in the form of waves or particles, they would be being emitted like light from the radiation source. It would be a true flux. So it's good to understand the term flux in general as a flow, but in the case of electric field, we have to keep in mind that the field lines are static. So here you have a, a different kind of flux. This is a uniform flux. So if this is a light bulb, uh, this might be a flashlight. Or more, even better example is light from the sun. So the, sun com the sunlight comes from far away and so it comes in as parallel lines. And if we want to talk about the amount of flux received, then there's two factors we need to consider. The intensity of the flux, and that would be how close the lines are together. We would represent it that way. And the area over which you're collecting the flux. So if we have, let's think of an example. So I drew a square. And this square is side S, so the area of the square is S squared. And imagine this to be a solar collector. So if we put it into the sun, then how much sunlight falls on the collector depends on what? It depends on the, whoops, didn't mean to move that. It depends on the intensity of the sunlight and we represent by how close the lines are together. It depends on the area of the flux detector or the solar cell, and it depends on the orientation. So notice, if uh, the flux lines are running along the x-axis, and this um, square is in the xy plane, and I put it in here, it's, uh, none of the flux goes through, it just goes right by. So in order to get the maximum possible flux, I would have to kind of rotate this around so it were facing this way, so that it were going in and out of the page. And then, if I brought it into the flux, it would get the maximum flux through it. So in order to, so there's two things. What we have is two things. Or really what I should say is three things. There's the strength of whatever's fluxing, like falling rain, could be light or heavy. Sunlight, it could be coming from behind the clouds, or direct sunlight. Um, or a light bulb. It would have more flux if we made the light bulb brighter. So the intensity of the flux, the area over which we're collecting the flux, and the position of that area relative to the direction of the flux. It's a little hard to show you that in two dimensions. So when it comes to electric flux, we have three things. So let me show you. The symbol for electric flux is an uppercase V. And we sometimes subscript with an E because we're talking about electric, uh, electric flux. And that will depend on the strength of the electric field. 
the area over which the electric field is um, being received and the cosine of the angle between them. These should be the magnitude of the field, the magnitude of the area, and the cosine of the angle between them. So there's something you need to know about area. If we take this area element and we want to make it a vector, we draw a normal to the surface. So if I were to draw a vector in the plane, then I could draw it in any direction. But the normal to the surface, a vector coming out of the screen, straight out of the screen, tells us the direction the area is facing. So when we talk about an area element as a vector, we'll always describe its direction as the direction it's facing. That means, let me write this down, the direction it's facing. And that's normal to the surface or perpendicular to the surface. So let's go back to the example of sunlight. I think it's um, easier. Whoops. Okay, we have a stray line there. Anyway, um, if I... So let's go back to the example of sunlight. How much radiation is this solar cell going to get depends on the area, depends on how intense the sunlight is, and depends on the orientation of it. And so clearly if you want to get the maximum solar flux onto the solar cell, you turn it so it's facing into the sun so that it's an angle of either 0 or 180 degrees to the direction of the sunlight. And that will determine how we get flux. If we turn this so that it's pointing out of the page and in the same plane as the sunlight, in other words, if, the, if it's facing perpendicular to the sunlight, then it won't get any solar flux. Another example would be rain. If you turn the screen and you see this is falling rain, and we hold a sheet of paper so that it's the thin edge is pointing into the rain and it's facing perpendicular to the rain, then the paper won't get wet. If we rotate the thing so it's perpendicular, I mean, so it's facing into the rain, then it's going to get wet very fast. It's going to receive the maximum flux of water. Okay, now let's go back to the less intuitive idea of electric flux. So this is no longer light. These are electric field lines. They're static. These, this is a uniform electric field. I hope you remember we would have two charged plates, a positive plate here, a negative plate here, and we would get a uniform electric field. And so when we say electric flux, we're talking about the amount of electric field that passes onto or through a surface. And visually, we can measure that by field lines. So if I take this square and I put it up here, only two field lines go through. If I put it here, three field lines go through. If I bring it over here, I have two field lines going into it. If I bring it down here, there's three field lines. So by where I place it, I can get a different number. So I can judge the flux by the number of field lines. Just visually, you can think of flux as the number of field lines hitting the surface or passing through the surface that we're talking about. So now back to our equation. We know that the amount of electric flux is going to depend on the 
strength of the electric field, the size of the area element, and the angle between them. And this is okay as long as the surface area, as long as the electric flux is, has one value. So if I put this square in a uniform field, the strength of the, whoops, <laughs> the strength of the field is uniform over the surface area. But if I take the surface area and I put it here, then the field is stronger here and weaker in other places. So there's no one value that I can use for the field. Or if the area were a curved surface, if we drew some area element that was irregular, like some surface like this, that is curved in three dimensions, then we can't use this simple equation because each part of the area would have a different field strength and a different angle. So this leads us to, in order to have a very general definition of flux, we have to use an integral. This equation works only if the field is uniform over the area and the angle is the same everywhere over the area. So I'm running out of space. I'm going to collapse this and come back and write down a more generalized definition of flux. Okay, so here's our formal, most general definition of flux. Since it's a surface area, it's going to be a double integral. And placed in, written in most compact form, we write it as the electric field vector dotted into the area vector. And what this means, if we know what the dot product is, that it's the surface integral of the magnitude of E times the magnitude of A times the cosine of the angle between them. And if we have, this is the flux, forget to write that in, F phi E. And uh, so in special case, like we looked at earlier, where the field is uniform and the area is flat, then we can simply write this as E A cosine theta, and we don't have to do an integral. All right, let's look at two examples. Um, here's a a cube in a uniform electric field. And consider this in three dimensions. Try and visualize this in three dimensions. And I know the lines aren't uniform, but imagine they are. And it's in three dimensions. It's going in and out of the screen and in the plane of the screen. And here's a half sphere. Here's a sphere that I've cut in half and I've tilted it a little so we can see its three dimensionality. So notice that the field enters the cube on this side and leaves the cube on this side and doesn't pass through any of the other four sides. It just like glances over them. And so you have a flux entering the hidden side, leaving this side and not passing through those four sides. So using this equation, you could easily calculate the flux through all faces. Notice the four faces, the cosine is going to be the cosine of 90. Again, I'll remind you, say this face here, that's facing up. So this area element here as a vector is pointing along the y-axis, the field is along the x-axis, it's the cosine of 90 degrees, and there's zero flux just what we can see because no field lines pass through that surface. They just pass across the surface. And similarly for the other faces, the one where it's entering, the cosine would be 180, and so the flux entering will be negative, and the flux leaving this face, the face is facing along i-hat, the field is along i-hat, the angle 
is zero degrees, and so it would be E, whatever the value of E is, times the area, and the area, of course, is just going to be S squared, so it's going to be ES squared. You could put any numbers in there that you wanted. Okay, when we come to the circle, the way the circle's supposed to be oriented is it's facing, right, this is facing along the negative x-axis, the flat cut half. So the field lines entering here are E. The area is going to just be pi r squared, the area of a circle, and the cosine of theta, again, like this side over here, it's facing this way, the field is that way, it's the cosine of 180, it's negative 1, it's going to be E times A, negative, because it's entering. Now when it's leaving, uh, you see the surface is curved. So I don't have time to discuss this, but the way you would do the integral, now you would have to do the integral this way. You would have to cut this curved surface area into a lot of little DAs, a lot of little surface area elements, and for each DA on this surface, you would have to know what the angle of the field was. I don't know if you can follow what I'm saying, but it's a fairly complicated um, integral to do over the curved surface, unlike the straight surface where the surface is flat, the angle is the same everywhere, and so you can just do Ea cosine theta. How do we deal with this problem? Well, either we do the integral or we use Gauss's law. So watch the next film, Gauss's law, which allows us to get the flux out of the sphere, knowing the flux into the sphere, using this other relationship that's important this week in what we're learning called Gauss's law. So now watch that video.